Eva Overalter. I'm the director of the Journalism School, and I am delighted to welcome you all today to our director's forum uh, with Nani de la Pena, who is really doing some cool stuff. Nani is our first ever, I think, senior research fellow in immersive journalism. Certainly you're the first in that, but I think in the journalism school you might be the first uh, research fellow. And the reason that I am thrilled to be able to say that Nani has joined us for this year in this role is that one of my great goals for Annenberg, uh, for the journalism school, is that we will do more to kind of push journalism forward and do the search that can help those who are attempting to do this very important information in the public interest in whatever way they're trying to do it. And boy, does Nani represent that. She's had 20 years in journalism, starting from the very traditional. She was a Newsweek reporter. On through just about everything there is, something through television, through documentaries, through all kinds of web stuff, and, and most recently, trans media in a number of very interesting ways. Immersive journalism, meaning, for example, her creations in Second Life, um, and also remarkable involvement in web video editing and, and a potential for people to do this um, together from various sites, which will have, I think, significant meaning for us as journalists and others who are doing communication in public interest. So, uh, she got her master's here at Annenberg last year. Many of you know her, I'm sure, through that, um, through the Annenberg program in online communities. And she's with us now in the journalism school, and it is my great delight to turn to both of you and Hey, thank you. I would appreciate you coming here. Do you mind just flipping the lights a little bit? I do have a few things to show you guys. Thank you. Wait. So, um, just a basic thing, immersive journalism, what is it? Novel way to utilize gaming platforms in the virtual environments, convey news, documentary, nonfiction, and it's a way to extend what we already have out there. Uh, I don't necessarily think it's a replacement to you, but it's another uh, way we can extend the way that we report the news. Um, it uses, you know, and I'm giving you these terms now, and I think you'll come to understand them as I get through the presentation, but I wanted to give you a heads up on the basic premises. Uh, basic premise. So we're, we're using spatially distributed and experiential narrative in virtual environment. You use visual and audio primary source material from the physical world, and you bring it into the virtual uh, sites. And you, you, you know, if you use highly immersive virtual reality, you actually affect more senses at once, audio, visual, uh, and uh, it's sort of a response about where your body is in space. So what is immersive journalism? Believe it or not, it's not a new idea. Uh, Walter Cronkite, he had a series of reports, you know, on, you know, uh, called You Are There. We wanted to take you there. What Marshall Gellhorn called the view from the ground. How do you get people to experience a story, to really understand the story? This is a classic one. The Mexican province of Texas is not a part of the United States, although it has been populated by a steady stream of Americans. These Texans, as they are called, are Mexican citizens. The province is part of the Mexican nation, but their difficulties with the central government have steadily increased. Now there is open rebellion. March 5th, 1836. The siege of the Alamo. You are there. So, you know, we're trying to do something a little bit different here, but obviously Walter Cronkite was trying to reach to get the same effect. Now, you know, George Clinton's sort of immersive journalism was to actually go and experience what it was like, for example, Paper Lion, one of his most famous uh, uh, stunts is going into the Detroit Lion, and to report what that meant, you know, what that felt like, and he felt it was the best way to really get people to understand the story of what was going on. Um, and similar ideas have surfaced in web journalism. Uh, for example, Jonathan Jude, who is the president of the Online News Association, um, back in you know 19, I think it was 2003, he did a thing on the New York subway in which he used audio and video and tried to bring the story together. And, and he, as he put it to this, uh, to this uh, in his book, he's saying the journalist can bring the writer, the reader or viewer closer to the truth by using immersive storytelling. Then you have a really interesting thing that's been occurring in games, in documentary games. You take, and very controversial some of these are, JFK Reloaded. In this case, in the documentary game, they ask you to be the shooter. 
did the thing really happen? Was there just one shooter? And the only way they think we can come to that truth or not is whether it can actually be done, and they ask you to try and do it in the game. There's Kuma Wars, which used John Kerry's swift boat controversy. What was a swift boat incident? What was it really like? What happened? And they ask you to come and be John Kerry and, and reenact for yourself the swift boat incident. Similarly, you have 9-11 Survivor, another very, very controversial game, and which you're actually put in the position of being one of the survivors from 9-11. Um, and interestingly, <coughs> the developer, Jeff Cole, not in relation to the Jeff Cole that we know and love here at Annenberg, um, the game itself is not really a game at all. It keeps no score, actual track of time. is merely a moment caught in time, which is often how we try and report on a story. We're looking at a moment or a series of moments and trying to report about what occurred. So I just want to also, while we go through some of this, I want you to keep these statistics in mind. It's pretty important because uh, some of this stuff seems a little bit uh, uh, far, you know, far in the future when it's really not as far as you think. Uh, average age of American gamers, age 35. Women now comprise 40% of the youth video game, which means that they have a bigger population than 17-year-old boys uh, or younger, 17 or younger boys. And 65% of households have a computer video game, 38% own a video game console. Let's just give you an idea that people are familiar with the kind of ideas I'm about to introduce. They're comfortable in these spaces. So, and before I actually show you some prototypes, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about why these things work, why does gaming work, why is gaming attractive. Um, it's, we are, what we are building, we are uh, building on, what we're building, we're utilizing studies on how people feel when they go into these spaces as using avatars. And um, it seems that we are hardwired to um, look at the screen, see something in front of us, see this representation of ourselves, and have a physiological response to that, a connection to it. For example, in this case, these goggles fed into this camera, so this guy can see himself from behind, right? So he can see his own body. And what they did is they brought a hammer down right here in front of the camera, so it was where he saw his body, and he jumped and sweated and had actually quite a nervous response to it, even though he could see that his own body was really actually in front of him. So what, the, where he was seeing things was important to his perception. So there are a number of studies about this, um, and um, it's, a, it's a really interesting arena in itself. Why do we have such reactions to what we see on the screen? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of prototypes that we've built. Some of you have seen the Gone Gitmo uh, build, but um, for a lot of you, I think it's going to be new, so I'm going to go through it again. So it's, we use the virtual environment of something called Second Life. Uh, it's a Second Life, it's a virtual 3D space. And this project actually began as a film. It was a film I made, a documentary I made in 2004 called Unconstitutional, about the civil liberties uh, issues that were um, uh, being Lots of issues and questions being raised post 9-11. I'm going to show you a tiny little clip from that film. I'll touch you a tiny little piece of a clip from the film. Are you going to turn it off? No. No. All right. No, no. We're going to turn it off. 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 We're going to turn it
be combatant, they're trying to use sort of propaganda on why we right. shouldn't care about them, why we shouldn't ensure due process for them, um, and kind of sacrifice our values as Americans that we held so high. BBC reporter Amy White was allowed to audio tape his visit to a place that had been previously off limits to all journalists. I'm walking now along the line of cells, which are eight foot by eight foot metal grids. We're deep inside Camp Delta. I can now see a group of men dressed in white, in t-shirts. These are detainees. They were just a few feet away on the other side of the wire, and one of them then spoke to all of us in English. <laughs> So the, this docu the documentary that I made was transformed through funding from uh, something called the Bay Area Video Coalition and the Carson Foundation actually gave us the money uh, to go onto an internet platform. But just like what that BBC reporter found, you know, how do you report a destination when you're denied access? So that's when we decided that we should build a virtual and accessible version of Guantanamo uh, in context of the real but inaccessible prison camp. And we did that by uh, using video, scripted out our experiences in live events, and we want people to be active participants in the story. So here will give you a better idea of what the project is. What happens behind these barbed wires? The little information that comes out of Guantanamo Bay through former prisoners, their lawyers, or the occasional NGO is remarkably consistent. They all report similar horrors. Beatings, electric shock, people chained to walls, floors, their heads plunged into ice cold water. Bolts, barking at naked prisoners, while loud music is being fired into their ears, people being taunted with pictures of their children, saying that you're never going to see them again. The screams of women are being used to break detainees' will. The man speaking here is British national Mwazam Beg. He spent almost three years in the infamous prison before he was released in 2005. In her 2004 documentary, Unconstitutional, writer-director Noni de la Peña used footage of Mwazam's father reading his son's letters from Guantanamo. I've been kept like an animal in a cage. They don't give me food. There is no one to help me. Under the second life named Noni Ryder, de la Peña is behind the Gan Gitmo project, situated on a rooftop on IML Island. The sim is run by the Interactive Media Division at USC School of Cinematic Arts. Noni is convinced that the issues surrounding one time more can be brought much closer to home via Second Life. There's a sense of the reality to it. So when your avatar goes into a cage, it's a very visceral feeling beyond watching it in a film, beyond reading about it in the paper. Geography doesn't matter. With a grant from the Bay Area Video Coalition, Noni and USC visiting Professor Peggy Weil used famous builder Bubba Fairchild to create interactive Guantanamo. Guantanamo is physically off limits to most citizens and press. Keep the topic out of sight and it stays out of mind. So in the face of a real but inaccessible destination, we felt that Second Life offered us a chance to build an accessible, albeit virtual, version. De La Pena and Weil also realized they would have to deal carefully with the implications of the big thing questionable interrogation practices. We do not torture your avatar. So rather than a torture chamber, we elected to build a contemplation chamber, a series of spaces to contemplate the reports and practices going on in Guantanamo, as well as the current news via RSS feed. As soon as I had put on my orange jumpsuit, I was thrown into the back of a C-17 transport plane, and... You are immediately bound, and then a black hood comes over the vision of your avatar. Shut up! We then integrated some sounds that were based on descriptions of what real detainees heard. When the black hood is removed, you find that you're in a cage. Most of the footage is from original Defense Department shots of detainees in Guantanamo Bay. A replica of Camp Delta will be added to this camp X-ray soon. 
though he wants it to include a habeas corpus game enhancing the simulation of a place outside of the law. Like a regular video game where you get your choices. What do you do now? Call your parents? Call your lawyer? Ask what you're in here for? And the answers are, no, you can't call your parents. No, you can't call your lawyer. Sorry, not allowed to give you that information. Noni de la Peña hopes her SL project reaches a responsive audience. On Constitution Day, residents used to build to interact with faculty from Seton Hall Law School, which has been on the forefront of analyzing and detaining records. Like other strategies of war times past, the idea behind Guantanamo is the dehumanization of the enemy, says Noni de la Peña. Second Life should be used for the opposite, meeting the perceived enemy face-to-face, -face, breaking down barriers, both geographical and in our heads. The Palestinian and Israeli border, a couple of gang neighborhoods, and then bring the gang members in to Second Life to take each other through their neighborhoods. Given what we know about how much people identify with their avatar, what kind of experience would that be for people? Fascinating indeed. I'm Drexler Dupre, reporting for Life for You News, contemplating the future of humanity in a tiny cell wearing orange. Mm. Okay, so <laughs> um, that particular dark, uh, uh, little, what's called a machinima, it's the way you, instead of taking a screen photograph, you take a screen video, and um, it won this uh, International uh, Human Rights Award and was presented by Jimmy Carter, Desmond Tutu, which is kind of amazing. So you know, I'm going to move on a little bit about with this and talk to you a little bit about some of the ideas behind uh, the concept. There was a discussion last year um, at the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, an argument between HBO, Sheila Nevins, and through some of the PBS folks. They were PBS saying we have to rely on recre recreation. HBO was saying we don't do recreation. Pitica Falls was you know, original footage that was all shot in a, in a, the whole film was made of live video from a mental hospital. Thin Blue, Thin Blue Line is notorious for having done these very, very beautiful recreations. So, um, what we were thinking about was the primary search material, that original imagery, informs the bills, right? That's the real shot that was an army soldier took of how detainees were being brought to Guantanamo Bay prison, and we were doing our best to kind of replicate it. We had a great builder. You can see some of the wonderful details that we tried to match. So, um, we also put in the documentary, you know, video, uh, actually, of the prison throughout the space to remind you constantly that this is not just a computer graphics environment. This is also an environment that exists in the real world. But we also do something to kind of um, even make the experience kind of a first person thing that, that it feels trying to achieve, where you're really there. And we do that by what, what we call scripted first person experience, immersive video and audio, and embodied edit. And what I'm going to do now is actually walk you through the prison to understand what that means. So the actual build, not the real prison, sorry. Virtual Guantanamo Bay. When you come into the space right now, here's your interior of the C-17 transport plane. Believe it or not, the stuff's going to actually move that into an, a body of a plane very soon. And you have to click on the wall there to get what's something called a HUD, a heads-up display. Usually when you're in a place like Second Life or computer games, you get to move around wherever you want. But uh, in this situation, when we take control of your avatar, we take away your agency. And you do that by giving the, putting on that HUD. You agree to let us do that. If you click on that, the next thing you know, you find that you're, in, you're bound. And then uh, as what happens is we then took, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever read Eric Sarr's book, who is one of the interrogators at, uh, in Guantanamo Bay, and we took a lot of his uh, comments about what was happening on the planes, et cetera, and comments from detainees to um, use, to create these transcripts that we then had actors read. So you would hear what it was like based on <coughs> this very uh, journalistic research and reporting. So this is happening through screen, and at first people think something's gone wrong with their computer, and then they start to realize it's part of the process. When it comes up, you find you're in a bound position in this camp x-ray uh, cage. And again, all the imagery you see are all these cages are based very much uh, built on uh, photographs in the same way that interior transport plane was built based on the photographs that we had from the uh, detainees being uh, transferred to Gitmo. When you come out of the... Uh, uh, into the cage, you're allowed to have your agency back and you can start moving around. And as you do, walking around the prison starts to trigger these film clips that came from the Defense Department. They originally released all this video to the press, kind of saying, look at the bad guys we swept up, but the imagery is not really very nice and people, there's a big international outcry about how detainees were being treated and therefore they um, pulled the video. So it took me a little while to actually get it. but. Um, uh, uh, the interna and funny, it's interesting, international sources have had it more than uh, national sources. So, 
Again, if you come through, um, of course you can fly in Second Life. You don't have to, which is another difference in the Gitmo prison. But, but um, we then were experimenting with how, when you put in this imagery, how does it affect your experience going through and your understanding of what the prison is like. And in that interest in one screen placement and where you put the screens and how that, um, how that affects your experience, we were also very much interested in screen size. And you'll see here, having this large screen relative to the avatar is sort of surprisingly effective uh, in adding a, an emotional uh, element to the presentation. Uh, after the outcry uh, of Camp X-Ray, um, there were new cells built very quickly. The, 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 you know, a, a complaint that the X-Ray was very inhumane, it displaced all prisoners, and they had to build something quickly, so they took um, shipping containers that are found on trains and trucks, split them in half, put uh, basically you know, this mesh in between, and then created these Camp Delta cages. Again, these are all built uh, uh, as close to spec as we possibly could. Um, and um, uh, I think if you look at the photograph, it would suggest our building did a pretty good job at trying to get the right details in. But this is where we began to again exper experiment with, you read about, okay, so they have no habeas corpus rights. And what does that mean to lose your habeas corpus rights? It's sort of one of those difficult things to describe that can take a paragraph. So we decided to try and do something here, all right? What's the, what are the implications? And so what we did is we designed this thing, and again, uh, everything here is sort of prototyped, and we're hoping um, uh, some researchers in Tel Aviv are going to actually give us guards to walk around our cell and be our respondent instead of having to click on the wall. So when I do click on the wall, what are my cues at? You press one, and then the guard answers down here. I can't tell you that. And then we click again, two. How long you keep me here? Guard, I don't have that information. Just so each in cell would have a series of questions similar to that, all to indicate how, uh, what it really means to lose your habeas corpus rights. As we described in the video, we weren't comfortable with, um, you know, people said, oh, are you going to waterboard people, blah, 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 which, you know, really we didn't feel appropriate at all. But we did think that there were um, some things to talk about. Um, we looked at uh, this being a very bipartisan issue, and we put up uh, ribbons about, you know, closed Guantanamo, and every one of these represents um, people from uh, both left, right, and center who have said close Guantanamo Bay, um, you know, including, you know, uh, Robert Gates and Condole even Condoleezza Rice. So, um, so we thought this was an interesting place to talk about this being a bipartisan issue rather than being uh, one from one side or the other. This is an RSS feed, so whenever there's stories about Guantanamo Bay, it automatically feeds straight into the space so you can get updated stories. Um, so if they do ever close the prison, it'll pop in here um, when you're in that room. So uh, in here, the Wall Street Journal did this wonderful piece on how, on poems from detainees in Guantanamo Bay. And then it was published in a book, and they offered to let us uh, put this up on the side with some recordings they did. And you click on it, and this is what you'll hear. He's been held in solitary confinement since the end of 2003, and according to the U.S. military, has tried to kill himself 12 times while in prison. Jamal Musari was transferred to Saudi custody on July 16, 2007. His status is uncertain. Death home. Take my blood. Take my death shroud and the remnants of my body. Take photographs of my corpse at the grave, lonely. 
sent them to the world, the judges and the people of conscience, sent them to the principal commander of their mind. Let them bear the guilty burden before the world of this innocent soul. Let them bear the burden before their children and before history of this wasted, sinless soul, of the soul which has suffered at the hands of the protectors of peace. So it's kind of interesting to take a Wall Street Journal piece on poems, goes to the book. I don't know that we presented it in this space where you kind of even interact with the poems and listen to them or not listen to them, learn more background about each uh, individual who wrote the poem as you go through, so you can really associate uh, the poetry with the, with the individual. And finally, in this last room, um, we just took uh, Freedom of Information Act transcripts were read by actors through ACLU and PIN voices. And they gave us, again, uh, the authority to go ahead and play the transcripts themselves in the space so you can sit and listen to the transcripts as read by actors in New York City. You are listening to programming from the 2007 Penn World Voices Festival. On Title of A, the Venezuelan mm -hmm. conducts what are called combatant status review tribunal hearings. Determined by the prisoners who continue to be detained as enemy combatants, in CSRT hearings, presumed to be enemy combatants, it's up to the prisoners to prove that they are not. Prisoners are afforded personal representatives who are appointed by the military, but they are not allowed to have lawyers. The following selection is from the CSRT hearing of Mustafa Ait Hitter. So that gives you a pretty idea of that build. There are a lot of interesting questions that come up about it. How do you do a spatial narrative when the story's all over the place and you who come in here to see it are controlling which you're gonna, which part of the narrative you're gonna get first or second or whatever, and also of course flying, which is a whole different way to go through a narrative, right? Um, you get uh, unexpected visitors. This was somebody who uh, was recreating, recreating Gandhi's march, um, who was working in New York City on a treadmill, walking through Second Life, and he ended up in our cave. Um, it also allows these wonderful um, live events, Seton Hall Law School's conference was broadcast into our screens in our bill. Anybody in the world could come and sit and watch their conference, but not only that, they broadcast Second Life on a screen there. So whenever we wanted to interact from our build and ask questions, we were simply there live as well. My partner came up the great term of Veritar, which is an avatar who appears in the real life identity. Obama and his campaign trail was in Second Life. And now I'm going to talk about our second prototype <coughs> what we did this summer with a wonderful lab in uh, uh, a guy named Mel Slater, and he's one of the top virtual reality researchers in the world, um, and he's interested in doing a partnership on, on working to extend this. Um, and um, one of the things we were talking about is, you know, how do you report, using, how do you use immersive journalism to report use of stress positions? I mean, you just hear such terrible graphi, graphic material on it. You know, stress positions where they urinated on themselves, uh, prisoners so bored the repeated slamming they're made in so-called stress positions, you know, kneeling positions for hours to avoid returning the wall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, pretty gruesome stuff being reported in the papers. How then do we deal with this? And um, uh, we decided the best thing to do was to um, give people a sense of what it meant to be in a stress position. And if you're going to uh, add some reality to it, we took the al who uh, logs who the Bush administration said had been tortured. And we had actors reading those logs. Um, and you heard it through a wall. So let me show you what that was like. And um, this was Mel uh, Slater's uh, laboratory, and this is where it was, was shot. So. so we put on this head mounted display with this laptop. Uh, Start to hear some sounds. These 
situation is, is that you're alone here in a room, we're all going, we're just going to pull the curtains, and you, you may hear something coming from another room. Okay. And you're here against your will. The audio may sound bad to you. Remember, it's being played through a wall, essentially through the way we recorded it, so that people are hearing it coming through a wall. So there's going to be distortion. Just turn it down a little bit. It's just really distorting the speakers. idea that like what if we built a virtual raft at the start of the war what if we had the country kind of laid out and you could actually go in and as battles happen and be recreated you could start to see what happened you could understand which marketplace was affected you could understand where the green zone was um, in relation to where other events occur um, I'm just this was this this particular piece of virtual raft and I'm just gonna a couple seconds of it was built over at ICT which is another USC institution they do a lot of work with the military and the military asked them to do this um, as part of uh, their training, but I think that we uh, should be thinking about these ideas as something we can adopt for journalism. And then I'm going to finish up with saying that we have a we have a some research questions and the really important ones to consider. You know, when's it appropriate to take control of the avatar, uh, like we do when we put you through the embodied edit, where you go from being inside the C-17 transport plane and into Camp X-ray, we're taking control. And that edit that's occurring is an edit where your avatar is taken from one place to another. It pushes you along the narrative much as any regular documentary editing would or story editing would. Um, again, it's important to think about accuracy in journalism and how do we maintain story when people are free to move around uh, and how do we maintain story, and, which is really not here. But when we have got the, the HMD on, when you're not really allowed to, to move on, how do we keep the story elements, the news, important news elements going? And finally, some things about scale and orientation of screen, which I'd like to do some research on and help with you. So that's it, guys. Um, and I'm open for questions. Well, I think you all will all agree that this is extremely interesting stuff. I'm going to sort of take the liberty of putting one question right out there firmly that was dominant in the time when we got to see some of this uh, last spring. And that really is the question of the famous objective of journalism, and that is objectivity. I know, as a great fan of your work, Nani, that when you say um, you were looking at the bipartisan, it was a bipartisan, uh, you know, a bipartisan agreement on closing Guantanamo. There's no question when you look at this, it is from a human rights perspective, which is a perfectly legitimate perspective. It's one I, you know, I certainly understand why it would be taken. As a person who believes in transparency as the, as the fundamental um, ethic that is going to bring us forward into an era where everybody makes judgments about what you're seeing, I guess what I think I want to ask is how, I mean, how do you worry as a journalist about being transparent about that? I mean, if you were really going to be, you know, sort of, I'm looking at all viewpoints, you would obviously, we had this discussion, you said you could do this from the point of view of the guard. It's, it, I think we all would agree that this is from a very legitimate viewpoint. It's from the, a viewpoint that is underserved, underheard. We don't get to put ourselves in it. This does it powerfully. Um, but it's hardly the viewpoint from, you know, here's a proven terrorist, and here are the guards who've been attacked. Or So it, it's not what any of us would sort of say as a whole round 
journalistic story, although you could certainly point to news stories that aren't either. So what, let's just go right at that from the top. Yeah, so. sure. Um, you know, I, I totally agree with you that my work has had, um, you know, has been dominated probably by human rights stories. So my perspective has been human rights stories. I think Guantanamo Bay is sort of an interesting one because it's got so many controversies around it. Um, I'm really, really excited to be working in Sandy Tolan, with Sandy Tolan's class this year um, on hunger in California. Now, um, and, I, and I think that doing something about hunger in California is just not going to create the same controversy. No, you know, people won't say, well, you're being objective here. Um, it's just that you're dealing with a political subject. Now, I, I think that I was very careful to take research that came from both military. If you saw in my constitutional <laughs> clip, I have Major Maury speaking. I have, you know, people from the military as much from um, from Center for Constitutional Rights being interviewed. Um, and so I think that the best that you can do is by trying to make sure that whatever you are reporting on and, and using the reporting to inform these things, it, sh it has to be as accurate and as thorough and as well researched as possible. And I think that's the best answer I can give. Um, can we next speak, though, to that question that you had up there about how does a reporter control the story when the avatar is controlling where they go? And so it seems to me that since you are controlling what the avatar sees, even though the avatar has control over what they, where they go, you're still controlling what they see. Right, right. So, so I, I would say there's two different things there. There's story and narrative, right. right? So narrative is just kind of how you get the story, right? And so I'm talking about narrative when I'm talking about how you how you well, the narrative versus the story itself. But I would agree with you, you have to be telling, like, I don't think anybody would not would publish a newspaper article without knowing they had a story that they were writing about, right? You've got to have that content's got to be shaped. In a traditional news story, you would say, we asked Homeland Security, we'd asked so-and-so for a comment on this, and they declined, or they issued a statement or something. There's, how do you, you just, at the top, just say, this, this is, I don't know how you do that, but again, this is, a, this, that. Is, this is a very controversial subject, so I think that's interesting. But if we're doing hunger, or if we were doing even, um, I had some discussions with Reuters about how would, it, would we build the plane going down between Brazil and France, and that's a good one, right? You get a lot of data, you can get a lot of information about understanding where the radar stopped and why it was off radar and why did it take so long to get a report in and. Uh, to find out the thing was missing, and looking at the various scenarios, this is the pitot tube. If the pitot tube would cause it to do this, that the pitot tube went out in the plane, or so. So, this is a particularly. I, 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 I recognize what you're saying that this, that the Guantanamo Bay, the stuff that has driven me and my interest, and and what brought Mel Slater to the table on this was on these human rights issues, which are going to have some of these. But even moments. hunger, I don't know what you're doing with hunger. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to do this, and I hope you don't mind. I'm trying to do this. I hope you don't mind. No, not at all. I mean, almost everything can be politicized. So I mean, nobody's for hunger, but there are plenty of people who are against feeding illegal immigrants. So I mean, or or putting on the dole. So I mean, I'm just saying, almost anything can come from a human rights perspective, and then be not. I don't say balanced, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, that's, that's true. That's true. And again, I think that the best answer I can have is you've got to do really good reporting that your that your investigation into the web your story you're doing has got to be a very strong and firm ground. Go ahead, sorry. You know, I mean, I, I really understand this question uh, that Geneva raised and that, that Judy is raising, but the part of me in the back of my mind goes, as Geneva mentioned, you could say this about any story. I mean, yeah. but there's never, you never cover every single point of view. You really don't. And, and, and part of what this actually, to me, amplifies is, is that truth, that, that, you, that you don't get in print. I mean, you don't know. I mean, it's there. They say they talked to somebody, but, you know, when did they call them? How hard did they try? It, it didn't fit the overall angle. You know, it's, you know, even if someone said something counterintuitive, you know, it might change the story, but it's very seldom that that kind of happens. And this is, to me, interesting enough, kind of, for me, the hard part is actually the avatar. I'm like, well, I'm just trying to get that one. But, but I, don't, I don't really have any issue with the actual journalism. It, because I, I don't think it's probably any more, it's in any ways it's sort of more expansive than some things. It's more transparent to me, because I know where this stuff comes from. But also because I know that it's just, it's very difficult in anything. I'm not sure one could do anything about a subject as controversial as Guantanamo 
that wasn't going to rattle it rattled us in some way. And I, I, I agree I agree with you that hunger to me is the same thing. I, I, I think it's a very good But this is something I would expect from Amnesty International not necessarily from an independent journalist. Uh, I mean, I'm not, and, and I, I just, I agree with what Geneva said. There is, this is a legitimate point of view, but what I expect from journalism, I mean, for instance, I would, would have appreciated getting like footnotes when you have like a picture or when you have, uh, when you're trying to demonstrate a particular fact, I can, I can go back to a source as to. <coughs> we, 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 in fact, have started trying to do things like uh, putting in Google Earth, uh, Post, you can click on it and click onto a website and get data or get backup stories or et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, because this has gotten more of that, again, more of that controversial um, uh, nature to it. And I, I agree with you that when you're writing about, when you're doing human rights stories, there is always going to be that question of whether it's, how much advocacy is there or not. So I agree with you that that, that can be, you know, and I, I think that as the Guantanamo stories unfolded, I think that. You would agree probably that's a story that needs to be told, the, the perspective? I guess it's uh, I'm, just I'm just curious, in terms of reading the New York Times, right. the, the Washington Post or the LA Times stories that I just printed for you, what 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 would you say about their journalism? Well, I mean, I think Rosenstiel, I mean, and Ellen's Ellen journalism, we talk about objectivity of means rather than object, the objectivity of ends. Uh -huh. and, and, I, and I guess I'm trying to, to translate what they're saying to, into this kind of immersive journalism, and I think that you know, when you're in that experience of, of being, of simulating a character, I don't necessarily think that, I mean, you're controlling the story. I mean, you, you as, the, I just don't understand. The objectivity here, I just don't, it, it crosses the line, I think, and I'm trying to verbalize how. Yeah. With this film on the left, is that a sound of the Oh, you, you choose. Okay, you choose. <laughs> um, so I have a question about the kind of scope of, of the projects that you're, as you're conceiving of, you know, you mentioned, you know, this, you know, an Iraq game, and you talked about, you know, a whole replica of the whole country and experiencing everything, mm -hmm. or, you know, you're talking about this hunger game, and, you know, it's, it sounds like you, there's a lot of ambition compared to, say, with Iraq, doing one small town, or <coughs> talking about hunger, you know, one street or one park. Um, I mean, the, so I'm just, you know, my question is, how do you deal, do you worry about reflecting, like, the incredible complex reality of a town, a street, let alone a whole city and country, and, you know, how do you, what, where do you find that balance when you're deciding? This? Well, I think with, with any stories that you're going to work on, you're going to have to, you're going to have to drill down and find something which, you know, is interesting to help you understand, like a, a personal story to understand the complexity. Um, and I think with anything like this, you're going to try and do that. In this case, I have the whole father of Mozambique, who was released from the prison after three years. Um, and so there's a case study about the prison where you're talking about a personal story within the context of this larger environment. Um, and I, when I say building the whole Iraq of Iraq, I'm not expecting people to know the whole of Iraq, but when you hear of a marketplace growing up, a couple blocks from the green zone, um, if you're able to kind of see where that occurred, you might have a closer understanding how unprotected the green zone is, how protected the green zone is, how close it is, what the locations are for, for our troops there. There might be a lot of information that, that in, you know, that you can come to, come to understand by using a bill like It's a fascinating question, really, isn't it? Because the fact is, you can give people more information by virtue of creating something, and yet that then begs the question, but you gave them just some more, and isn't that dangerous? <laughs> As opposed to reading a newspaper story, which, you right. know, you'd say, well, what all did they leave out, you know? And, the, and it's really an interesting question. Yes, back here. There's one behind me. Oh, OK, good. Two back here, and then over here. So, so I'm thinking of this from a, from a technological I mean, uh, I'm thinking of this as just a technological version of setting the scene, just as a writer. So I'm almost seeing two sides of this discussion of the ethics that are in this. As well. and just as a writer, we've set a scene with a very descriptive moment and, and great uses of, of uh, uh, sensor, sensory descriptions and whatnot. You're doing this through some sort of technological standpoint, using what technology is available. But where, where I have the problem is going back to your um, your airliner example of this, this plane going down over over the Pacific, and I'm wondering what your perspective would be on a story that set the scene of an imagined scene on based on this data that you had made available to you of 
you know, someone there in that experience having that sound of that, a plane ripping apart and the smells and all of that. That that's, was one of the controversies about that. that uh, that's why I put up the Survivor 9-11 for you. Because that's a similar thing, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's exactly why I described the information we would get. I, you know, and the same reason we don't try and waterboard anybody in our Guantanamo Bay. I think that nobody writes about the downing of that plane and writes, and they smelled this, they probably smelled this, and they might have, you know. You, you, there are certain lines that you, I think you don't cross, and I think we were careful not to cross in here as well. But isn't that what, if, for example, if you did this Iraq thing before the war started, there wouldn't be an on-the-ground understanding before the war of what that, these marketplaces looked like once the bombs went off. Because, for example, journalists wouldn't have been there to describe what it looked like and sounded like at that moment of the, of the bombing. So there, there'd be some, there would be, be an imagination and a recreation anyway. And so I, I just don't see how, how you can make the judgment of something being too difficult to deal with in the sense of, of not putting someone I'm in. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused about what you mean. Well, I've got, you've got plenty of imagery of the marketplace before, and then you have lots of imagery of the marketplace after. Why yeah, would that be difficult? Well, well, in the sense that there wouldn't have been journalists on the ground. I mean, marketplaces move around, settings move around, people who are in the marketplaces, and the, and the, and the atmosphere of the weather on that day, all the different factors are different. And so going back, and, and I have problems. I mean, I've written a blog post specifically discussing this, this subject with uh, thin blue line, and I think I think the critiques that have been issued about thin blue line over the years. A couple of years ago, uh, Errol Morris did a defense of his use of recreation, and it was, you know, it's it's pretty fraught with this. this well, you guys might want to take that one outside the yeah. room so we can move along. We don't have a lot. Is there important questions? And I'm sure the two of no, you really can take it to a more sophisticated you. level. Sandy, and then over here. Um, I mean, this whole the whole debate about you know objectivity. I mean, is, is something that obviously we could spend days on. Uh, but the notion, I mean, to me, what, what distinguishes this is, first of all, there's this sense that, I mean, I think of the false sense that when you read something else, you're getting the whole story, you're picking up on what Ernest said. What, what I find distinguishes this, and it, and it could be a link to what we do in the hunger classes, this is experiential. It's not trying to say this is the entire story. I mean, you do actually have records. You do have public records. Mm -hmm. You do have statements. So, but but it's what would it be like if you were X? Okay, if you were hungry, if you were in Guantanamo. I mean, and and what it is is it adds a piece. Right. It adds a hugely important piece. But it doesn't say, hey, this is the entire story about Guantanamo and it's, it's you know, objective journalism 101. It's experiential. I mean, it almost, I almost feel like you could say experiential journalism in that sense, yeah. as, much, as well as immersive would journalism. So I think it adds Or would it be absurd, given where we are in the progress and given the fact that we do believe, no matter how imperfectly, that a commitment to objectivity has had value, wouldn't it be possible in a case like this to say, at the very beginning, this is told from the standpoint of yes. a human rights advocate with journalistic values. There are clear journalistic values in here. You see, uh, you know, you see the documentation. You see a very important commitment to verified and verifiable. But but it really is clearly from a perspective. And however much we may think we have carried out objectivity imperfectly, it is rarely so clearly from from an obvious point of view. And you could say, well, I mean, who's for human rights? Violations, but on the other hand, Jack Bauer. <laughs> 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 I, I just find out I'm wondering if, in the name of transparency, you couldn't proudly say something like that. It wouldn't in any way diminish the experience. Although at the same time, I think there's so much journalism that passes as objective. It's just as much coming from a point of view, uh, an yeah, insider point of view. We can't do anything about that, but we can do something about what we produce. I mean, we're sure. going to salvage all of that by doing more of it. Yes. Um, is there an opportunity for the, the, the player um, to um, leave information behind, not just collect information? Mm -hmm. um, um, we, we, oh. well, while we haven't had that, that is something we've really been interested in. And we, we really wanted to create a board for people at wall, people to come and, and add stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But we have been always open to the idea. If anybody's contacted us saying, hey, you know, maybe you should add this and 
we said, well, if you want to build it, please come, because you know this has been a, this has been a, a labor of love in the sense that we don't have a we don't have a big um, checkbook where we can pay everybody, but we're happy to, to bring other people in to work on stuff. Like a builder is a little bit more of a sophisticated uh, second life user. Uh, I'm talking about just the everyday writing on the prison wall. I don't think you know, like a blog is <coughs> in the direction. And to write something. Um, and I just wanted to credit uh, Henry Jacobs' class, or a lecture uh, for, from Henry Jacobs' class for that idea, because I came here because of the transmedia portion of it. And he stated, as opposed to eight to it, was that. Um, Could you speak a little louder, please? Uh, where should I start? Mm -hmm. uh, so there was uh, one of the lectures at Henry Jacobs' transmedia class, and that's the reason I came out from the after meeting. Um, gave his eighth rule for I see a couple of students in some class. But he said that the eighth rule was that the user can um, leave an impression behind. And I, I, I feel like that might be the solution to you know, these questions about objectivity. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and you know what? There's some very interesting um, comments. Because um, the, the, the videos on YouTube, right, the first Gitmo one. So there's an extraordinary array of comments people have left on that, um, which you're right about. Maybe what we should do is try and put a link within here so that people can automatically click. Because you can do that now in Second Life, where people can just click and then see all the comments. And if they want to write the comments, it would appear on the space as well. It's another way to make it easy for people. So they don't have to know the Second Life technology. They can go to YouTube and leave a comment, and it'll appear right inside. That's another great idea. I love that idea. How come the jail's empty? We don't see other prisoners. Um, we, that's why we chose that defense department footage, because um, we felt that there's some technological constraints for sure, but we also weren't, it felt too kind of false to us that, you know, it wasn't, um, we weren't dealing with real prisoners, we'd be putting these fake prisoners in there, and we, we were trying to stay kind of true to the story, and again, this question about the if we put all these kind of, what kind of position would they be in, what would they be sitting in, would they be hungry, would they be food, would they be, you know, you have a lot of ethical questions that get raised when you start thinking about how you depict a prisoner in the cage, and we thought it was better to just use the real footage to show you what the prison was really like. Mm -hmm. Jen? Yes, um, have you done uh, any audience studies in this, in terms of how people actually, you know, interpret or experience news, because I think what, Sandy was saying, you can experience from, you know, through this, you get a different perspective, but of course a lot of people will already know a lot about these stories from the print media television, and it's sort of the convergence argument that uh, how this, this plays into this whole experiencing news. Uh, I don't know how, if, if the audience studies would No, but what a great thing to do this year. Uh, hopefully, well, I'm here doing research. I would, I'd like to do some, we, we, give me some prototypes, right? I'm not saying this is the best way, the only way, the exact way. I'm only saying we're exploring these ideas. And can these platforms be used in a way that we can do really good reporting and good journalism and um, experiential journalism? You know, we were just talking about another, we still use, have print media, we still have radio, you know, these are not new media. Um, and this just might be another platform in which we figure out ways to get on news. So that's, that's really what my goal is for the year. And I'd be really interested to know how audience feel about the story, like the habeas corpus questions or, you know. Who else? Would you say, I mean, let's do a little poll, you know? This, because this is, real, this is exactly why I'm excited about this. There, there's no question, this is out there. For all of us who've been doing journalism a long time, for those of you who are just sort of learning the basics and we know what the cardinal rules are, this presents new opportunities which raise enormous new questions. And you're really in an interesting position because you embrace this and you bring journalistic values to it, but you also have a background as something of a human rights advocate and you know so it's a really let's acknowledge that it is a really interesting stew enormous potential very exciting to see um, I don't know how many of you are in journalism actually I should ask you that or how many of you are in the journalism school PR or journalism raise your hands okay so those of you who are in the journalism school either PR or journalism and who are hearing these sort of you know here's what information the public interest looks like how many of you are more unsettled than excited by this. More unsettled, raise your hand. More excited, yeah, more unsettled. I'm not surprised. <laughs> okay, more excited, <laughs> raise your hands. But would those of you who have your hands up now feel that 
we could help as a, a, a group to, because Nani really wants to do this, to think about, okay, how do we answer these questions in ways that help us uh, move this forward? I think one of the things we want to do this year is have these discussions so that we can really think about how do we address both the very strong, positive responses and be sure we protect that, but also the very real, unsettling uh, issues. Ed, why don't you say something? <laughs> <laughs> With a constructive and forward <laughs> way. I'm really ignorant of games and all of this. It's, it's, it's a world I've never entered and probably never will. But let me ask you. I think how, you just did. <laughs> I'm curious enough. How, do, how much does it cost? Do you list and how much time does it take? Um, this, this, the second life, one thing about, I think I've said this before, but second, I don't know if I'm talking for repeating myself to you, but um, uh, second life itself is a very robust and inexpensive environment. I mean, it, it, for sorry, example, inexpensive? very it's inexpensive. inexpensive. You can just send your avatar in. It's free. Is your concern that this would take a lot of money away from other kinds of journalists? No, it's free. That's a concern, yes. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's free to people to go in. Um, that whole Second Life builds, it's just a couple thousand dollars the most to do. It's very inexpensive. And um, the reporting is different. Reporting to shape the story, that always takes time. So it depends how, how deep and investigative a story is versus, you know, you know what, or, or not even that. Like when I did the piece for the New York Times on the Talking Fish story, that was a month of research just because I really had to understand how to fish talk, right? And it was out of my league, right? To really, I mean, it was fun to learn it, but I, I had to learn it. So that took a long time for that reason. But, but so you, you're first, you're talking about the reporting, but the actual build these things is relatively inexpensive. Doing full games that you're talking about, that's a different genre. I, one thing I want to, before you go into the room, I want you to really think about this. Games, I think of it things that you're motivated by, you know, uh, your decision. You have to make a decision here, and if you make a decision, it's going to have consequences, et cetera, et cetera. I'm trying to step away from that. I want to talk to really drive these builds by um, good story time, by good reporting. Um, and the same idea that we have a story that's beginning, middle, and end. Are, can we replicate that in this space versus trying to make, make the make the learning about the story, like reading the story, watching the story for the story's sake of interest to get people in the spaces versus I'm motivated by gameplay. Um, that's my last comment on that. We can think about that. Interesting. Instead of oh well, nobody wants to learn about state budgets, but maybe if we pretend it's a game, they'll learn. Which is the other way that journalism is using games. Maybe a couple more quick questions, and we ought to wrap up because we're on the board. Well, I just was wondering, could you do? Would, would you have um, built perspectives from like the guards' perspective? Like, could you add those narratives? Because I do think that that would absolutely get more rounded and, and yeah, yeah. Depending who who they would be, absolutely, we would um, we would be happy to. We would be happy to. I and mean, that's why, in fact, Eric Saar, who I said we're going to wrote a book on his experience at Guantanamo Bay as a soldier, um, we've just been contacted with him about possibly coming to speak live in the space. So we're really open to having, um, we, in fact, we're discussing with Justin Margulies, another attorney, to come and bring both sides and have a whole discussion in our, in our, in our forum space there, live with different sides to discuss Guantanamo Bay. <coughs> you know, whatever issues, so we'd like, we'd love that. We would love to have all those perspectives there. I think that's another way to deal with your objectivity questions. If you bring the different sides to discuss it, you know, people, will, even people with, you know, any any perspective on how the prison would go. Look, we would get more people there if we get Dick Cheney to come and talk. <laughs> we'd have a different perspective on this. How about the perspective of a journalist trying to get to Guantanamo and like what you have to go through and have, what channels and funding and all that stuff. Maybe show people that, as a reporter, you want to tell the story, what's going on there, but this is what we have to do to go through. The BBC reporter who I talked to, who I had shown, who got thrown out of Guantanamo Bay just for trying to talk to a detainee and actually do a job, um, he's agreed to come and talk in space whenever we want to. So we have, we, it's just a matter of, of the time and stuff on that, too, of course. That part of time is really the, the most painful part of it. To, to your, to your okay. point on, on transparency, I mean, I think one thing would be just a little bio, one line 
A journalist specializing in human rights reporting. Okay. Yes. There it is. I mean, you don't have to say advocate. I mean, you're a journalist. That's your focus. People go, okay. I mean, to me, that's, I mean, one could haggle over, you know, the, the degree of transparency, but to me, that's pretty transparent. Bio helps, for sure. Yeah. Yes. How do you envision uh, the, the audience um, interacting with you and your I hope that it will, um, I mean, what's my dream for it would be that it would be adopted alongside major by major news organizations. It would be something that would just, they'd have great reporting on a story that would, you know, you watch a short video, you know you can then read a longer piece about it, and then you can have an experiential <coughs> element. And then there's blogs to have the back and forth also a question to me. I don't think these are, I think it would be a really nice part of that whole project. That's my kind of idealized vision of well, I want to thank all of you for being here. This is exactly the kind of discussion I think that we can have with one another to move this forward. To me, one of the most important aspects of the kind of work that Nani is doing and that uh, Henry speaks about is that we want to bring these values to where everyone is. And the statistics we saw at the beginning that you put up there are a hell of a lot better in terms of young consumers than those of us who, are, who believe that only legacy media can do it. So. Um, thanks very much for being here. This is just a